Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast, Ion Mobility Mass Spectrometry in the Omics, presented by Chris Chenard, Assistant Professor of Chemistry, Department of Biomedical and Chemical Engineering and Sciences, Florida Institute of Technology. I'm Alexis Cross of Labberts, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labberts. Labberts is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your question into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. Our speaker will, answer, will respond to your questions via email. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chenard. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you for the introduction, Alexis. Today we're going to be talking about a tandem technique, which is ion mobility spectrometry coupled with mass spectrometry, and especially for its use in the biological omics, being metabolomics, lipidomics, and proteomics. And so I'd like to start off today by going through some of the very basics of ion mobility spectrometry. This is a technique that's been around for several decades now, but has actually just really come into vogue for omics studies over the last couple of decades, uh, thanks in part to um, some uh, very fundamental research that's been performed, as well as a broad scale commercialization of this technique. With ion mobility spectrometry, it's a separation technique based on gas phase ions as they move through an electric field. The original and the most basic form of ion mobility spectrometry is a constant field, or what's referred to as a drift tube ion mobility spectrometer. And this is the general diagram that you see here on your screen. However, it's important to note that there are several different flavors, so to speak, of ion mobility spectrometry. Uh, another one that's been used for several decades now is what's referred to as high field asymmetric waveform ion mobility spectrometry, sometimes referred to as Fames, but you may also see this referred to as differential mobility spectrometry or DMS, um, such as with the SciX uh, Selexion platform. And in this particular type of technique, rather than having a constant field, we actually have an alternating field where we go between a high field, as you can see in the pink, uh, and a low field, which is applied in the gray for a slightly longer period of time there. And what this actually does is the ions will move between electrodes uh, depending on differences in their high field and their low field mobilities. Another more recent advent is called uh, the traveling wave or TW IMS, and this was first invented by Waters Corporation over a decade ago. Uh, and this was really the first big commercialization of ion mobility spectrometry. Now, unlike with a constant field drift tube type device, this actually uses electrodes that undergo a dynamic field where you can see these waves that slowly move through the drift tube and ions, depending on their mobility, will either ride on the front of these waves or roll over. And so the higher mobility ions will move more quickly as they ride on the waves, whereas the lower mobility ions will be inclined to roll over more frequently and arrive at the detector at a later time. Now, with drift tube ion mobility, which is the majority of what I'll talk about today, as I said, the ions are pulsed into the drift tube with a constant electric field. So you can see over there on the left where it says ions enter the drift tube. A packet of ions, and this is a spatial and temporal packet um, that's narrowly confined, are pulsed into an electric field drift tube, which is kept in a constant electric field. And these ions will experience collisions with drift gas molecules within the tube and are separated ultimately based on differences in their size, shape, and charge. Now, it's important to note that unlike with mass spectrometry that many of you may be aware of, uh, in which we do measurements at a high vacuum, 
Ion Mobility actually makes use of the collisions between our analytes of interest and our buffer gas molecules. So this is done at either an intermediate pressure of around a few torr, all the way up to atmospheric pressure. Now, with these collisions, smaller ions will experience fewer collisions, and so they'll travel at a higher velocity, whereas larger ions will have more collisions and will go more slowly. Now, this is important to note that this is not just based on the mass of the ions. This has to do with the overall size, which uh, could be a, the same ion that might be in a more compact or more elongated form, which would result in different mobilities. Now with ion mobility, what we're actually measuring is a drift time added detector. This is the amount of time it takes from start to finish. And based on the length of a drift tube, which you can see here is L, divided by a drift time, we can calculate the actual drift velocity for any given ion. But what we really are interested in is this mobility factor K. And based on the drift velocity calculated from the drift time, we can use that in conjunction with the electric field that we apply across the drift tube to calculate this mobility factor. You'll also often see this referred to as K sub zero or K naught, which just takes into account factors such as um, your standard temperature and pressure. And this is the way that you would account for those using this equation here in the bottom right. So the basic mobility concept here is that if you take two different ions, and in this particular case, we have fatty acids that have one double bond in the middle of that chain. And one of those double bonds is in the cis configuration and the other is in the trans configuration. Now using something like a mass spectrometer, what you'd find is that the mass to charge, the MZ would be exactly the same and you might not be able to differentiate between these two. But you can tell from the diagram on the left that they have very different structures. And so as you pulse these through the drift tube, you'll find that they move at very different drift velocities. And ultimately, as we put up a spectrum, a drift time or arrival time spectrum, you'd see that they'd have very different arrival times. And the heights of these peaks can actually be used to represent the relative intensities of these two. Now, one of the uh, ideal advantages to using ion mobility is the way that it nests with other commonly used analytical techniques. So many of you will be familiar with using things like chromatography, LC, GC, either, even things like supercritical fluid uh, chromatography. Now, these kind of separations take course over the span of several minutes or even with longer proteomics analyses, several hours. And with that time frame, we're, easy to, we're able to easily nest ion mobility because these spectra are acquired on the order of a few milliseconds, anywhere from uh, five up to about 100 milliseconds, depending on the type of ion mobility instrumentation you're using. And so with these, we're able to, for each given LC peak, we're able to get several ion mobility spectra across this. Furthermore, when we use something like a fast acquisition mass spectrometer, like a time of flight or TOF instrument, where we're acquiring data on the order of about 100 microseconds, we're then able to generate individual mass spectra for each one of these ion mobility peaks. So in this particular case, where we have two very similar mobility peaks, we're actually able to tell if there are differences in their mass to charge, or if they're similar, they could be isomers. Now, this is a, a very simple thing that you will have seen in any of your analytical chemistry courses where we take hyphenated techniques and by adding several stages of analysis, we're actually able to increase our signal to noise. So by going from a single stage like an LC or a GC or even a mass spectrum and coupling those together, uh, in step two here, we go to LC MS, and in step three, we go to LC with tandem mass spec. But by further in implementing the step of ion mobility in here, what we're effectively doing is reducing the chemical noise even further. And although the signal does go down by a little bit, the signal to noise ratio is still going up. And so we can, we can get better and more confident identification of techniques based on this hyphenated method. So for those of you that are visually inclined here, I've included a diagram of an ion mobility mass spectrometer with a time of flight mass analyzer here on the back end. Now you can see a few ions that are trapped here in the bottom left corner right before the ion mobility drift cell. 
Now, because what we're actually measuring is the amount of time that it takes from start to finish, we have to trap these ions in a very small temporal region, some kind of a trapping area. And as soon as we hit start, uh, analogous to runners in a race when you might have a starter's pistol go off, you'll actually see the ions that will then move through the drift cell at various velocities and ultimately be analyzed using the mass spectrometer. This allows us to get two characteristic pieces of information for every ion. The first that you'll see on the y-axis in this diagram here in the top left is the drift time. And that's the amount of time it takes for the ions to get from start to the end, which is the mass spec detector. The second is because we are using a mass spectrometer, we're able to get the mass to charge value for all of these ions as well. And this allows us to create these characteristic three-dimensional plots of drift time versus mass to charge that gives us an extra dimension of separation in contrast to traditional mass spec that just has the one. Now, when we also couple this with something like tandem mass spectrometry, um, something like a QTOF, mass spectrometer, we can also isolate a given ion and fragment in the collision cell, or we could just allow all of the ions to collide. And in that particular case, when we're doing all ion fragmentation, we're able to line up our precursor ions with our parent, uh, with our fragment ions, because this is happening after the ion mobility drift cell. And as such, all of the ions, regardless of how they're fragmented, will have the same drift time. So you can he see here a peak with a mass to charge of 623 is being fragmented down to a mass to charge of 402, but it still remains with the same drift time because this is happening after the ion mobility cell. And so this is really helpful in being able to line up your precursor and your fragment ions after a mobility separation. Now, ion mobility has several other advantages, and one of them is that we do get that additional separation of components in complex mixtures. So if we take something like chromatic here, we have several peaks. We may also see that we can get things like co-eluting compounds that are isobaric or isomeric. And in this particular example, we have this one peak just after five minute retention time. And if we look at the mass spectrum there, we only see one primary peak. However, if we go further and we look at the ion mobility spectrum, we now see that there's actually two distinct peaks with very different drift times. And what this is is actually stereoisomers that have the exact same mass to charge, co-elute chromatographically, but are resolved when we use ion mobility measurements. Now, we can take the measurement of drift time and calculate the mobility factor K, but we can also take it one step further into this parameter that we refer to as a collision cross-section, or CCS. And this is useful for identification because we can couple it with a retention time library and a mass charge database, and we can form these large libraries that will allow us to identify unknowns. And so I have an unknown steroid, or I should say a known steroid here in pregnenolone, with a drift time, and using this equation, which is a modified version of the mason champ equation, which takes into account several different experimental parameters, things like the drift tube temperature, the gas that we're using, the buffer gas, um, which we put in terms of the reduced mass, uh, as well as the electric field, the length of the drift tube, and especially the drift tube pressure. Um, which we also refer to in terms of the number density or the number of buffer gas molecules we have um, per unit of volume. And so with these cross-section values, which are it's important to note that these cross-section values are dependent on these temperatures, these pressures, as well as the actual type of ion mobility you're, you're doing, whether it be a simple drift tube static field measurement or something like a traveling wave measurement. It is important that these values can differ based on those conditions, and so you should always mention what conditions you're using to determine a particular collision cross-section. And with those collision cross-sections, you can see here that if we create those three-dimensional plots of CCS or drift time versus mass to charge, we can then match those based on those two different values. And we see that we get a distinct, uh, a dramatic reduction in our false positive rate when we combine those two. And so when we go one step further by using uh, both chromatography as well as tandem mass spec, our confidence in identification goes up dramatically. Um, and this goes down to a false positive rate of nearly zero, which is in some cases even better than using very high resolution mass spec, uh, such as with Orbitrot based platforms or FTICR based platforms.
Now, it's also important to note that in addition to being a very useful separation technique, ion mobility also gives uh, some relative structural information for gas phase molecules or gas phase complexes. And we can look at things like binding strength or overall complex size. And we can also look at the way that these interact um, within an ion mobility spectrometer based on the energy that we impart on those. Um, so you might imagine that in a case where we have two different isomeric ions that may have different conformations or different structures, while a mass spectrometer might not allow us to differentiate between these two, because their structures are different, we can, in theory, separate them using ion mobility. So I want to start off by talking a little bit about chemical biology and the omics and how ion mobility mass spec can help with these particular things. Now, you're all very familiar with this diagram where we go from our genetic information in our body through the transcriptome creating proteins and ultimately creating metabolites, which influence our phenotype. Uh, now, these things are also influenced by outside factors such as our microbiome, as well as our environment or our exposome. But while we have genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics that are very much closer to the genetic makeup of our bodies, the metabolomics or the metabolites within our body are much closer to the actual phenotype. And so this is one of the reasons why metabolomics has become uh, one of the more popular omics sciences over the last decade. However, metabolomics is actually not new. And here we have what is the urine wheel that was first published in 1506, uh, where scientists and physicians would actually look at the color, the viscosity, and even in some cases, the taste of urine to help diagnose in diseases. And fortunately for us, we have instrumentation like mass spectrometers and ion mobility spectrometers that allow us to analyze our samples so that we don't have to taste and smell uh, urine or other biological samples anymore. Now, when we're looking at ion mobility mass spec spectra, we tend to get these uh, conformational ordering of biomolecules that allows us to further identify unknown types of samples. So what you'll see here on the left is a plot of a number of different compounds, some standards that we use. These are tetraalkylammonium salts, as well as other common biological molecules such as lipids, peptides, and carbohydrates. And here on the right, what you'll see is that these uh, separate out into these individual bands such that if you had an unknown with a given collision cross-section and mass to charge, you might be able to place that unknown molecule into a given band and have more confidence in saying, I think that this might be a carbohydrate based on the collision cross-section and mass to charge combination. So let's take a look at some actual examples of uh, instances where ion mobility can help us to separate things. So here we have a couple of steroids, pregnenolone and 5-alpha-dihydroprogesterone. And these are intermediates in the biosynthetic allopregnanolone pathway. And we see that the structures for these, like many steroids, are very similar. However, when we look at them with an ion mobility spectrometer, we're able to tell them apart. And they have collision cross that differ by quite a bit. You see a collision cross-section there in angstrom squared of about 176 for pregnenolone versus 191 for 5-alpha-dihydroprogesterone. And again, I've highlighted here in red the structural differences between these two because they are very subtle. The pregnenolone on the left has a hydroxyl group, whereas the 5-alpha-DHP has a ketone group there. And there's also the presence of a double bond in pregnenolone that's absent in its isomer counterpart. Now, the separation between these two, uh, the resolution is about 1.23. So this is nearly baseline resolve for these compounds that are uh, not able to be distinguished with single stage mass spectrometry and also would require chromatography, extended chromatography, to be able to separate them. Now, here's a number of other examples of common biological steroids. Uh, these are all isomer pairs that you would require extended chromatography. Um, in some cases, uh, tandem mass spec will be able to separate these. But for a lot of the stereoisomers, things like testosterone and epitestosterone down here in the bottom left corner, these actually can't be differentiated with mass spectrometry. But ion mobility allows you to baseline resolve all of these compounds. Now, another thing to note, with these particular ion mobility spectra that I'm showing, 
conventional or commercially available types of instrumentation still have an inherent lack of resolution or, or a limit on the ability to separate very structurally similar compounds. And so throughout this talk, I'll be making mention of a few different examples of strategies that we can use to, to further or augment the separation. And so I've shown an example here where we have a few more endogenous steroids, testosterone, dehydroepiandrosterone, or DHEA, and epitestosterone. And you see here that we separate these with a drift tube uh, ion mobility spectrometer. We see that the testosterone is well resolved, but the other two compounds are uh, essentially overlapping. We're not able to resolve one from the other. However, when we change over to a different drift gas, uh, in this particular case, the spectrum was acquired with a nitrogen drift gas, which has become the most popular choice because uh, it's fairly cost effective and it's also readily available. When we switch over to another drift gas, something that might be larger, more polarizable, like carbon dioxide, we see that these compounds start to resolve. Uh, now, this is certainly not um, a universal trend where we see moving between drift gases will always improve separation between isomers, but it can be very helpful in particular, uh, particularly tricky situations like the one I've shown here. We can apply this to a lot of other types of omics compounds. Here, I've shown three different types of um, bile acid isomers, and you can see the only difference between these, um, between the one on the left and the one on the top, is the difference in position of one hydroxyl group. And between the bottom two, the GCDCA as well as the GUDCA, the only difference between these is the stereochemistry of one hydroxyl group. So these are structurally very similar compounds, but when we use high resolution ion mobility spectrometry, we're actually able to separate these out quite well. And this particular analysis was done using a very high resolution ion mobility spectrometer, uh, which is called the Structures for Lossless Ion Manipulations or SLIM platform. And I'll talk about that just a little bit later. We can also look at things that have quite a bit of structural diversity, things like glycans, where we may have isomers that include different monomeric subunits like galactose, glucose, and mannose. We may also have different types of connectivity such as alpha-1,6 versus alpha-1,4 linkages or beta-1,4 link linkages. And again, the structural complexity of these becomes a little bit confusing, and because of that, um, Ion mobility can be a really useful tool because these structural differences allow us, as you can see over here on the right, this technique allows us to separate these compounds fairly routinely. Now, I talked about conformational ordering of biomolecules based on differences in their class, but I also mentioned earlier that ion mobility allows separation based on size, shape, and charge. And so what you'll notice is if you're looking at a very complicated mixture, uh, like a phosphatidylethanolamine mixture here um, that we've shown in terms of drift time versus their mass, we actually see these characteristic bands based on their charge, uh, whereas the lowest mobility ions, the plus ones, um, will be at a uh, much later drift time relative to their mass. The plus two, plus three, and plus four ions will have a higher mobility. We can look at things like fatty acids, and I showed a very brief example during my introduction where we looked at the difference between a cis and trans double bond, but we can also look at differences in the placement of double bonds. And so here I've shown the comparison of a fatty acid, a saturated fatty acid, 18 colon zero, in comparison with fatty acids that have a double bond at either the nine position or at the 11 position, and those that differ as well in the cis and trans configuration. And here you can see that all four of these different isomers, the cis and trans 11 and cis and trans 9, are also separated from uh, the saturated 18 colon 0 fatty acid here, and we're able to resolve all four of these compounds using ion mobility. We can look at other types of lipid structural differences, things like differences in the SN1, SN2 configuration, as shown on the left, 
where the tails are actually swapped on the head group. We can also look at differences in the actual backbone um, or the head group on these lipids, where two different things that might be isobaric or isomeric will have very different gas phase structures and can be separated with ion mobility. And as I said, we can separate differences in things like cis and trans orientation, as well as in the S and R configuration um, on the actual where the uh, tail group meets the head. So I want to go into a little bit of a de uh, detail about a cool story that we had uh, while I was at the University of Florida looking at vitamin D metabolites and the importance of a particular set of epimers or the C3 epimers. Now, vitamin D, the analysis for vitamin D deficiency is actually uh, one of the top clinically run assays or one of the most popular clinical assays in the entire country. And this is especially important in infant and pediatric as well as in pregnant populations. Um, but it's important to note that these have been identified even in normal adult populations. And so being able to differentiate between these isomers is important. Now, what you'll see here on the right is the structure for 25-hydroxy vitamin D3, which is the most common target analyte in vitamin D deficiency assays. But at the bottom, you'll notice that it also has a hydroxyl group epimer, 3-epi-25-hydroxy D3. And that's the only structural difference between these two is the stereochemistry of that hydroxyl group, whether it's alpha or beta to the ring. Now, this epimer down here at the bottom has been shown to have reduced calcium regulation and has also been um, has also been shown that it may have some um, some kind of effect on different types of cancers. But many LCMS methods do not differentiate between these epimers. And as structural isomers, uh, mass spectrometry, even tandem mass spec, cannot differentiate between these two. And although chromatography can, it can be a longer chromatography run that's not always ideal for a clinical analysis, where you want to have runs that are down as low as two minutes in time. Now, because they're often not differentiating between these two, the overall result or what you're getting for a 25-hydroxy vitamin D3 concentration can be positively biased because you're actually adding the sum of two different compounds. Now, there's also a higher ionization efficiency for the epimer, which further biases the results. But ion mobility is a potential improvement in that, based on differences in the structure for these two, we should be able to separate them. And what we've shown here is that for the common mass spectrometry ion, which is the M plus H minus water, uh, unfortunately, these two do not separate very well. But another strategy that we can use to further separate things that are very structurally similar is to look at different types of ion adducts. So here we're looking at just a protonated water loss adduct, but we can also look at things like sodiated or even potassiated adducts. And so here I've shown the two epimers in orange and blue for 25-hydroxy vitamin D3, as well as um, the plant-derived source of vitamin D, which is 25-hydroxy vitamin D2. And when we look at the ion mobility spec uh, spectra for these, we actually see that they're fairly similar in collision cross-section, certainly not baseline resolved by any means. But if we look out a little bit further in the drift time spectrum, we notice this one peak here that's present only for 25-hydroxy D3. And at a, larger, at a later drift time, we know that this corresponds to some kind of larger structure. And this is where ion mobility helps us to determine what that is. Now, when we look at the mass spectrum for each of these individual peaks, this additional drift peak that's unique to 25-hydroxy D3 in comparison with uh, this primary peak that's seen here around 25 to 26 milliseconds, we note that the mass spectrum denoted here by A and B is exactly the same. This is just the sodiated 25-hydroxy D3 or epi-25-hydroxy D3. So why do we have that extra peak there uh, at B, and why is it only present for one of the two compounds? Well, a further strategy, in addition to looking at different types of ion addicts, is to actually use theoretical modeling, which has made leaps and bounds in helping to look at gas phase structure for biomolecules. <laughs> 
And so if we go back to the structure for 25-hydroxy-D3 shown here, we really have two different locations where the sodium can form the ion. One is on this C3 hydroxyl group down here in the bottom left, and the other is this tail group hydroxyl group up here in the top right. However, we also have a potential third option where because of the structural flexibility of 25-hydroxy vitamin D3, which is a seco steroid, uh, which means that that B ring on your normal steroid structure has actually been cleaved, we can actually have this bend around such that the sodium ion is interacting with both hydroxyl groups at the same time. And in doing theoretical modeling, we show that indeed this is the lowest energy conformation structure is with this uh, vitamin D analyte and what we call the closed conformation. Now our theoretical or uh, the cross section that we get through theoretical modeling matches very closely with that that we figure out experimentally. And so we know that this is a good candidate for our structure. However, from our theoretical modeling, we also notice that there's another local minimum, um, which is at only a slightly higher energy. And this is one of those cases that I noted before, where maybe the sodium ion is interacting with only one hydroxyl group or the other. In this particular case, we're showing the structure where it's interacting with the C3 hydroxyl group. And when we look at energy diagrams for 25-hydroxy-D3, we note that the difference in energy between that closed and open conformation is only about 2 kcals per mole. So this is an energetically uh, accessible conformation, these two different conformers. However, when we look at the same thing for the epimer, the epi-25-hydroxy-D3, we see that that difference in energy is much larger at about 10 kcals per mole. And this is energetically inaccessible, such that while the 25-hydroxy-D3 can adopt both of those different conformations, the epimer will only adopt one of them. And so if we go back to our original spectrum where we see two different peaks and a unique peak for 25-hydroxy-D3, we're actually able to conclude that this is a result of a different gas phase structure, this open um, or more elongated version of 25-hydroxy-D3. And so the reason that this is important is for two reasons. One, ion mobility in conjunction with um, the theoretical modeling actually can give us information on differences in the gas phase structure and what do those differences actually mean. And furthermore, because these two compounds adopt very different structures, we're able to separate them such that we could do something like an LCIMMS analysis and actually give quantitative results for just 25-hydroxy-D3 without being biased by its epimer. So we're going to shift gears here a little bit and talk about another version of the omics. Uh, specifically, in this case, we're talking about proteomics. Now, proteomics is a huge field, and in many ways, it's a little bit more complicated than small molecule metabolomics or lipidomics. And if we take a particular protein, something like retinol binding protein one that's shown here, this is a huge molecule and much different to analyze um, in comparison with some of the smaller vitamins or lipids that I've shown previously. Now, generally speaking, we split proteomics up into a couple of different fields. We can talk about top-down proteomics. This is analysis of intact proteins. So as these very large tens to hundreds to even thousands of kilodalton proteins, and it can be very challenging experimentally and often requires very high resolution mass spectrometry, um, things like, as I mentioned before, Orbitrap or FTICR-based platforms. However, something that's much simpler and easier in terms of an instrumental burden is what's referred to as bottom-up proteomics. And what we do is we take these proteins and we actually use some kind of an enzyme, uh, such as trypsin, and we actually cleave these proteins to create very small sequences, uh, very small peptides, and then we can identify these individual peptides and put them back together to identify a protein. Now, like I said, this is a much less of an instrumental burden because we only need to identify these very small peptides. And it is indeed the most common method, especially for any time, any type of quantitative proteomics. But it's important to note that even when we've split these up into much smaller peptides that are easier to analyze, we can deal with things like isomers where we may have um, 
different sequence isomers where the peptides will have a different grouping of amino acids, but ultimately will be analyzed and detected at the same mass to charge value. We can also have things like uh, post-translational modifications or PTMs that might occur at different residues within the peptides. And when we have that, um, as shown here in the bottom with this peptide that has two highlighted uh, S residues, in this particular case, we could have a post-translational modification at one group or the other group, but we can't really separate these using mass spectrometry alone. However, they do have very different gas phase structures. So when we take a peptide like this, and we analyze it both with chromatography. Here on the left, we show a chromatogram where this particular peptide elutes at about 45 minutes. We can also look at the mass spectrum, but unfortunately, we see the exact same mass to charge value for both of these peptides, and we can't differentiate between the two. However, when we look with high resolution ion mobility, such as with the SLIM platform that I previously mentioned, we're actually able to differentiate between these two based on the location of that post-translational modification. In this particular case, it was a difference in the location of a phosphorylation. And so this is really a prime example of a way in which ion mobility can go one step further than your traditional LCMS and even LCMS-MS types of proteomics analyses. And so this is a little bit of an older example, uh, but it really, really captures the power of ion mobility where if we use these three dimensions of mass, uh, mass to charge retention time, chromatographic retention time, and a drift time, we can actually plot these out in this cool plot here um, and also use a heat map for the intensity, the relative intensity of these features to identify literally thousands of different features from in, within one proteomics digest. And this significantly increases the number of features that we can identify in contrast with just LC and or MS alone. Now, in addition to uh, the kinds of structural information that we can get uh, for intact proteins um, or even for metabolites, we can also look at the ways in which we can probe these with different amounts of energy to actually get protein structure in a little bit more detail. So in this diagram on the top, we've taken a protein um, that has many of these alpha helices, and overall, this protein is in a fairly compact format. OK, and you can see that as a function of a very short drift time. However, as we start to move up from bottom to top, we're increasing the collision voltage and ultimately imparting more energy on these proteins. And as we do so, you'll start to see some of these regions actually unfold and elongate. And as you increase the collision voltage even further, you'll see that in the top right corner there, that these, these proteins have become almost completely unfolded or elongated. And based on their ion mobility drift time, they have a much larger collision cross section. Now, this is a technique that's referred to as collision-induced unfolding, or CIU, and it creates these plots here at the bottom where as a function of collision voltage, we can actually see the ion mobility drift time increase. And we create these plots where we'll see the characteristic points between uh, very compact structures into intermediate and ultimately into very elongated structures. And we can also tell a little bit about um, the energy of that folding based on how much uh, collision voltage is required to start to separate these um, and to elongate them into the more unfolded format. Now, ion mobility has really exploded over the last decade, uh, as I said, thanks in part to a very widespread commercialization. In fact, the majority of mass spec vendors that you'll look at in some shape or form will have their own types of ion mobility that can couple um, with their mass spectrometers. Um, and these include things like traditional drift tube IMS, a traveling wave IMS, as well as things like FAMES or differential mobility spectrometry. But what are some of the directions that we need to move towards in continuing to expand upon IMS analysis? Well, one of them is moving towards higher resolution instrumentation. I mentioned before that a number of the platforms that are commercially available on the market still kind of lack the resolution necessary to routinely separate very structurally similar compounds. 
And in this particular case, we can go through some of the strategies that I that I hinted at, things like using different cation or anion addicts, using different types of drift gases um, to augment the separation, and even using theoretical modeling to further identify structural differences. However, there have also been a lot of advances in ion mobility instrumentation, and I've named a couple here. Tri-ion mobility spectrometry, which is a, an advance um, that's been um, developed by Bruker um, is another type of very high resolution ion mobility um, that can give you a little bit more information than with other types of commercially available platforms, um, as well as another uh, type of ion mobility, Structures for Lossless Ion Manipulations, or the SLIM platform, which is developed by the Smith Group at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, and this is actually a technique that's had some of the highest reported um, ion mobility resolutions um, in history. Furthermore, we can also look to couple ion mobility with higher resolution mass spectrometers. Now, I've primarily talked about time of flight or top based uh, mass analyzers. And the reason for that is that ideal time nesting that I showed very on in the top. Things like Orbitrap based platforms do have a much lower duty cycle and as such, it can be difficult to couple the two in a very routine manner. However, there have been instances of coupling IN mobility drift tubes with Orbitrap based platforms. And if we can do that with very high resolution IN mobility, then we're getting really the best of both worlds where we're getting high res IN mobility as well as high res accurate mass, uh, mass spectrometry measurements. Next, we want to have more continuity in the measurements as well as the calibration uh, for CCS determination. And what this means is, unlike with mass spectrometry, where we can populate the databases of M over Z values, with collision cross sections, it is very dependent on the type of conditions in which you're making the measurements, be it the temperature and pressure, the type of ion mobility you're using, be it a drift tube or something like a traveling wave platform, we need to have more continuity in the field in the way that we make the measurements and also in the types of standards that we use to calibrate the instruments. We can couple ion mobility and or mass spectrometry with further types of techniques. We can do tandem mass spec or even all ion fragmentation where we're not discriminating based on a parent ion, but we are fragmenting all of those and using that uh, characteristic uh, matching of drift time with um, parent and daughter ions, um, as in all ion fragmentation. We can also use spectroscopic techniques, things like UV and IR spectroscopy, to actually get more structural information for compounds after they've been separated using ion mobility. And finally, we can look at things like gas phase chemistry, where we can do ion-ion and ion molecule reactions, um, either to complex some of the compounds and augment their structural differences for better separation, or to do some kind of ion molecule um, dissociation. Uh, there's some cool work that's being done with ozone-induced dissociation that selectively cleaves at carbon-carbon double bonds. This is especially important for things like lipidomics, uh, where we have a lot of diversity in the place, uh, the location, the configuration, and the number of double bonds present in these types of lipid isomers. We can also look at ion mobility with a number of different novel sampling techniques. Um, so ion mobility with imaging is something that's really just started to creep into the literature. Uh, but you can imagine for imaging, uh, things like MALDI or even DESI imaging um, that lack a type of pre-separation like a chromatography, uh, using ion mobility because it's so fast and it's done in the gas phase can really uh, extend the utility of mass spec imaging. We can also couple this with ambient ionization, as I mentioned, things like DESI, or even things like rapid evaporation uh, or REAMS mass spec, like as in the case of the eye knife, and we can get an additional dimension of separation using ion mobility. And finally, I've put clinical analysis here with a question mark. And the reason for this is ion mobility has really yet to see a routine implementation in the clinical lab. Um, but in fact, it's really not been that long since clinicians readily adopted uh, the use of LC tandem mass spec. And now it is considered the gold standard in clinical analysis. But I believe that within the next five to 10 years, you will see ion mobility in some shape or form um, become adopted in the clinical form and really 
advance the types of analyses that they can do um, to help um, physician-patient relationships. So I'd like to finish by acknowledging several people. Uh, my former team at the University of Florida, Dr. Rick Yost uh, and Dr. Adrian Reutberg, who helped out with a lot of the modeling that you've seen here in today's presentation, uh, as well as a few of the graduate students there at UF, Robin Emperman and Venetius Cruzero. Um, my other former team at Pacific Northwest National Lab, Dr. Dick Smith, Dr. Yahia Ibrahim, and Dr. Gabe Nagy, um, who's very uh, influential in development of the SLIM technology, uh, as well as some of the high-resolution ion mobility spectra you saw during today's talk, uh, as well as Dr. Erin Baker, formerly at PNNL, now at North Carolina State University, especially for her insights um, in some of the ion molecule reactions, as well as the lipidomics. And finally, my commercial sponsor, Agilent Technologies, um, without whom I couldn't do all of my ion mobility research that I do. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions from the audience. Um, and as Alexis mentioned, um, any questions that we don't get to, I'd be happy to respond to via email uh, in the very near future. Thank you, Dr. Chenard, for that informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar, and we'll address some of the most commonly asked questions by our viewers. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. Our speaker will follow up with your questions via email. So let's get started. Our first question is, can IMMS separate in, excuse me, can IMMS separate in nantiomers? That's a very good question. So we recall that enantiomers are mirror images of the same compound. In a lot of cases, uh, they have very different biological activities. You think back to an example like uh, thalidomide back from the 50s and 60s, um, where these two enantiomers actually had um, dramatically different effects um, on pregnant women and ultimately um, on, on the children that they bore. Um, and with enantiomers, unfortunately, their collision cross sections, because they are exact mirror images, their collision cross sections and thus their mobilities are identical. So as parent compounds, enantiomers cannot be separated with ion mobility. However, there are some caveats to that in that if you're able to complex enantiomers with some kind of chiral reagent. There have been numerous studies in the literature where this is a strategy that does enable separation of enantiomers, although it's by no means universal. and It's definitely still in its infancy in terms of um, really developing strategies to routinely separate enantiomers. Now our next question, how can resolution of structurally similar compounds be improved? So like I said, there's two main ways that we can improve upon uh, resolution of structurally similar compounds. Obviously, we can go to higher resolution ion mobility platforms, things that I mentioned like trapped ion mobility and even the SLIM platform develop at PNNL. Um, but if we don't have access to those, if we have uh, a lot of other commercial types of drift tube or traveling wave instruments, we can do things to modify the chemistry of our compounds. And this includes things like derivatization, which is a commonly used strategy with chromatography as well. Uh, we can derivatize to augment structural differences. We can also use different types of complexing agents or cation or anion addicts um, using things Rather than just simple protonation or sodiation, we can go to larger types of ions, other alkali or alkaline earth metals. There have even been cases where transition metals are used to change the structure enough to be able to separate structurally similar things. Um, and in some cases, using different drift gases um, like carbon dioxide, even sulfur hexafluoride has been shown in the literature to improve some of the separation um, for structurally similar compounds. And it looks like we have time for one more question. What are the major barriers to routine implementation of IMMS in clinical settings? 
So with clinical analysis, we're thinking about a lot of figures of merit like sensitivity or specificity, the speed and the cost. And so the point at which um, ion mobility mass spec really benefits the clinicians in terms of those different figures of merit uh, is where they'll start to adopt this technique regularly. So with sensitivity, remember that we're doing most of these analyses using a time of flight mass spectrometer, which is really not the most ideal quantitative platform. Um, so we can see instrumental advances where we're using other types of mass spec um, to be more sensitive and to give better limits of detection. Um, in terms of specificity, we're certainly gaining more information um, and better confidence and identification when we're using ion mobility. Um, and speed is certainly not an issue because this nests very well with LCMS, which is really the gold standard in clinical analysis right now. And finally, in terms of cost, as these instruments become more readily available and more easy to manufacture, certainly the cost of the instruments will come down, and that will mean the cost per analysis for clinicians will also be decreased. And so ultimately, it's my belief that within the next five to 10 years, you will really see a routine implementation of ion mobility mass spec in clinical settings. I would like to once again thank Dr. Chenard for his presentation. I would also like to thank Labberts for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January of 2019. You will receive an email from Labberts letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.